right, well, um, good evening, everybody. It's uh, wonderful to see such a robust crowd uh, here for our Great Lakes Plastic Pollution Lecture. Uh, my name is Lisa Apple. I'm the Watershed Education Coordinator here at Cranbrook Institute of Science, and I'd like to welcome you to our museum. Uh, if you're interested in this uh, subject matter, I'd like to encourage you to explore our Nature Conservancy uh, lecture series on Great Lakes conservation topics. Uh, there's these trifolds available um, outside the door and our first lecture begins Thursday, March 12th, so it's coming up soon. So I hope you've had a chance to see our plastic exhibits upstairs in the upper lobby. It's um, brought to us through the Five Gyres Institute and the Alliance for the Great Lakes. And it certainly has some compelling artifacts and artwork to tell the story of the problem of plastic pollution in our oceans and our Great Lakes. Um, and it's here through March 15th. So we begin our time here this evening learning about local pollution issues and the efforts made by uh, our local watershed organizations to address them. And so we have three brief presentations by our community partners. We'll begin with Friends of the Rouge, then Clinton River Watershed Council, and then out to Alliance for the Great Lakes. Um, then we'll have a brief intermission and we'll begin our uh, lecture tonight for Dr. Jennifer Daly on the problem of microplastics in the Great Lakes watershed. So we begin closest to home with Friends of the Rouge, and so I'm pleased to have Cindy Ross here here. She's a river restoration program manager with Friends of the Rouge and I've worked with Cindy in numerous capacities on green infrastructure, um, volunteer events, water quality monitoring here on Cranbrook's campus. So uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Cindy and thank you for being with us this evening. Thanks Lisa. Hello everyone. So I need to move this. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I'm the River Restoration Program for Friends, Manager for Friends of the Rouge. I coordinate our river cleanup event, Rouge Rescue, um, as well as our river restoration um, stewardship projects and activities and public education. Um, So the Rouge River flows through all or part of 48 communities. Um, it's 126 miles of river. Um, it drains 467 square miles of land. And it's home to just about 1.5 million people. So that large number of population has a real impact on the water quality in the Rouge River. As you can see, there are four main branches in the Rouge. Um, here we have, can we see this? Uh, we have the main branch starting up in Troy, flowing through Birmingham, Beverly Hills, Southfield. Um, we have the upper branch that starts out here in West Bloomfield, Farmington Hills, Farmington, um, flows through a piece of Livonia, Redford, and meets up with the main at Eliza Hall Park. Um, most of us are familiar with the middle branch because Hines Parkway uh, encompasses the middle branch of the Rouge River. Um, and that's a unique branch because it has this special tributary to us, the Johnson Creek. And that flows through Salem Township, Plymouth Township, um, and Northville Township. Um, that's the only cold water tributary we have in the Rouge River watershed. Um, uh, and then finally, we have the Lower Rouge here uh, that flows through um, Superior Township, Canton, uh, Wayne, Inkster. They all come together um, close to our office at the University of Michigan Dearborn, uh, just before Michigan Avenue. And then this here is the main stem. This is the more urbanized part of the Rouge River watershed. Um, so, uh, thank you. Um, that's probably the only time I needed to use it, but thank you. Um, <laughs> so Rouge Rescue is our oldest event. Uh, Friends of Rouge was founded in 1986, and we began with Rouge Rescue. Um, back then, we were pulling massive amounts of trash out of the Rouge River. Um, um, and uh, the event itself has engaged just under 2,000 people a year. 
um, on average since 1986. Um, we have we range uh, annually in about 38 to 40 work sites. Um, the event has resulted in less dumping reported at our work sites. Um, over the years, we have removed so much trash and change started to change public perception that we're not seeing the dumping that we used to do in much of the watershed. This feels close. Um, and the event uh, has evolved because of the loss, the lack of trash, which is a great thing. Um, in 2002, we really started shifting some of the focus of the event, and we're doing a lot more stewardship activities, restoration projects, stream bank stabilization, and other types of projects, invasive plant removal, to um, improve water quality, um, improve habitat, and um, improve the health of the Rouge River. So last year, uh, we had just under, or just over 1,500 volunteers participate in the event. Um, we had 43 work sites in 22 communities. Um, our volunteers are awesome. They do great work. Uh, so just in a few, really a few short hours per person, uh, but with that large number of volunteers out doing the job, we removed 133 acres of trash from 344 acres of land. That's huge. Um, that includes 57 tires, shopping carts, household items, large like furniture and appliances. Um, but the bulk of this trash is the countless water bottles and balls and plastic wrappers and other debris that we're picking up. Um, and most of that is making its way to the river through um, combined sewer overflows, through just wind and water carrying that to the river. Um, I mentioned that we have built our restoration and stewardship activities into Rouge Rescue. So this year we have um, removed 1,200 cubic yards of invasive plants from 68 acres, helping to improve the biodiversity of the region. Um, we have installed 3,600 native plants, wildflowers and grasses, um, and 75 trees. This helps to improve uh, or reduce the impact of stormwater and helps to reduce the amount of stormwater running off into the rivers. Um, and then our volunteers are also working to manage large wood debris in the river um, and maintain trails so that we're keeping the recreation strong near river corridors. Um, the overall impact of the event since 1986 is huge. We have touched over 56,000 people um, and involved them in the cleanup effort. Uh, we've had over 860 work sites across the region. We have removed over 47,000 cubic yards of trash, including 64 vehicles, 1,800 tires, 510 shopping carts, and 245 um, large household items. So these are mattresses and f pieces of furniture and um, small appliances, large appliances. So you can see the impact of the event is pretty huge. That's a lot of debris that has been removed from the river corridor and the river itself. Um, we're working to improve the biodiversity, protect water quality by removing over 11,000 cubic yards of invasive plant material and restoring the natural processes by planting 16,000 native plants and 550 trees, helping to reduce that stormwater impact. One thing I did want to point out is, if you look at this picture, this is a typical log jam in the Rouge River. What do you see? You see lots of water bottles, lots of plastic balls. So we love log, log jams because they collect that stuff for us. You can go right in and remove the, the plastic debris and the man-made trash, open it up if you wish, and let the water flow. So we need you. Uh, we need you to help us. Uh, we have our event scheduled this, this year for Saturday, May 30th. Um, but we also have other activities throughout the year. We have our river restoration projects where we're installing demonstration, stream bank stabilization projects, or native plantings, rain gardens. Um, we're working to 
maintain those gardens to keep them working well and looking good. Um, we have a Rouge Education Project that works with the schools, working with students, teaching them water quality monitoring, and having them go out to sample the river. Great learning opportunity for the kids. We also have our volunteer monitoring. We are um, sampling for the benthic macroinvertebrates. We're looking at the life in the stream. This allows us to assess water quality over time. Um, we also have a frog and toad survey where we're training volunteers to listen for the breeding calls of Michigan frogs and toads. And they report back to us what we're hearing. Frogs are an indicator, um, and toads are an indicator of healthy wetland systems. They need healthy, healthy wetlands for their breeding, but they also need a good habitat upstream, um, upland habitat for their adult cycle too. Um, and then we're doing fish monitoring as well. And we're working really hard to develop a canoe trail on the Rouge River on the lower branch. So we're really excited about that. And then lastly, we have the Explore the Rouge series that we began last year as a pilot to take people to different places across the watershed, special places um, led by people who are connected to the site um, to teach us about um, birds or toads and frogs or just the, the special park. So join us, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy. We now welcome uh, the Clinton River Watershed Council. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, uh, and we'll begin. And uh, I would just like to say uh, that we have Michelle Arquette Palermo here with us and <laughs> Amanda Oparka. And Michelle's the um, program director from the Clinton River Watershed Council, and she also um, was a Cranbrook employee for like nine years, and so she really knows this place and began the Water on the Go, one of our signature watershed education programs here at the Institute of Science. So it's really nice to have her back, and she has gone on to do amazing things for the Clinton River that you are going to hear about. So thank you, Michelle and Amanda. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out. Um, like Lisa said, we're from the Clinton River Watershed Council, and the Clinton River uh, Watershed uh, has a lot of the same issues that the Rouge does. Um, it was when I left the Rouge and went to the Clinton, we, all, you know, it was a little different, but a lot of the same issues. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But just to give you some geographical context, the uh, Clinton River Watershed. Let's see, is it this one? Nope. You gotta turn it and press the button. I did. There we go. There we go. See, I can't go to work any day without this young lady. Um, anyway, so the Clinton River watershed is um, 760 square miles, um, but st starts up here in St. Clair County and Lapeer County. And um, the headwaters region is Springfield Township. Um, Independence Township, and then the river goes 81 and a half miles out to Lake St. Clair. Our organization has been in place since December of 1971. Um, we began as a local association of local governments because six citizens found out that the Armored Corps of Engineers and their infinite wisdom wanted to turn the Clinton into a concrete channel. And those six citizens wanted to fight that and they started the Watershed Council and here we are 40 some years later uh, working to still protect the Clinton River. Oh, I'm sorry I flipped way too fast. Uh, just real quick, um, we are also home to 1.5 million people. Um, so, I don't know, we used to say that we were the most populated watershed in the state, but after watching Cindy tonight, I'm wondering which one does have the biggest. Yeah, you guys, so. Um, we might have to, we're gonna have to figure that one out. Um, but we have, uh, our major tributaries are the north branch of the Clinton River, uh, Stony Creek, which has some cold water streams in it. Um, our major cold water body is Paint Creek, which is 16 miles long, and it has a natural uh, reproducing trout population. Then the main branch of the river, like I said, goes 
81 and a half miles out to Lake St. Clair. So we work within those 63 communities and then we also work with an additional nine communities here that are um, drained into Lake St. Clair. And now we've expanded our mission to include the top um, here in the Anchor Bay. So we're now working in communities such as New Baltimore, New Haven, and Chesterfield Township as well. And then I'm gonna turn over to Amanda who's gonna talk about our cleanup programs. So we right. have a couple. Can you tell us what a cold water stream is? Oh. <laughs> No, oh, that's okay. Can I answer? <laughs> you can't say. You, you a ahead. cold water stream is a stream that is below 20 degrees Celsius and can support um, sensitive uh, fish species like trout, rainbow trout. And brown trout, and some of our streams also support brook trout. All right, so our uh, cleanup program that we have is called Keeping It Clean, and I did not do all the historical stuff that Cindy had. I gave me a spark in my mind to go back and do that um, on Monday. However, um, our Keeping It Clean program houses all of our cleanup efforts and in a couple slides I'll go through and talk about our, clean, our different programs that we have and how you guys can help. In 2014, we had over 700 volunteers remove 60 tons of trash and debris from 60 different cleanup events. Um, and the pictures we have here this picture down here is with Macomb County P Public Works Office and we are actually pulling out um, large trees in our watershed. We have a lot of issues with dead ash trees and a lot of issues with the log jams piling up and we were working with the county to pull out um, some large trees so that they could open up the river for a sanctioned canoe race that they do every year. Um, when we use can we use kayaks to help us clean up because everybody likes to kayak and come out and clean up. Um, this picture down here is with some GM volunteers. We get a lot of volunteers from GM and Chrysler to come out and do our cleanups. And this was at Lake St. Clair Metro Park. So here, do you want to do this? <laughs> um, and this is our typical, what we find in the river. Um, the largest portion is uh, plastic bottles and cans, um, and then we do find the shopping carts, food wrappers. This other 26 over here is the food wrappers, so plastic bottles and cans and food wrappers make up over half of what we find. Um, we also find a lot of... Doop. We'll start with these pictures. So this is a typical thing that we find in the spring or in after a large rain, once the water recedes, we'll find piles like this on the sides of the streams. And I took this pic, oh, sorry, it'll be in a minute. <laughs> Here's myself pulling out a shopping cart. <laughs> we find quite a few shopping carts actually. And I learned that you can't just go take the shopping cart to the scrap yard. Actually, um, you're supposed to call the store they came from and um, they'll come pick them up. Actually, I had a Kroger manager tell me, no, 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 I'll come get those, even though they had been in the river for years. So, um, here's a typical thing that we find by the, anywhere there's fishing, we find these um, bait containers. And as you can see, it says, please do not litter on it but it's one of the most common things we find along the lake. Um, so here's a picture I took actually um, by Lake St. Clair and the Clinton River Spillway. And this, if you can see, is all just tiny bits of plastic. So let me back up here. So this picture here is of the bottles and then this is what it breaks down into. So it just keeps getting smaller and um, Actually, this right here is a bottle cap that's broken down, and so that leads me to believe that all these other little pieces are similar items, bottle caps, and um, we find a lot of lighters. And then fishing line. Fishing line is um, something we find. This is a whole roll of fishing line that I picked up. Um, and this gets left behind, and animals get caught in it and injured. And Here's some more stories. Here's a picture of our log jams that we have. Um, Cindy showed a similar picture. Um, 
you can't see great here, but there's some there's quite a bit of plastic in there. We find a lot of actually flip flops. I find a lot of and um, tennis balls are a big one, and then the plastic water bottles in these log jams. And I think the tennis balls um, are probably from do dogs throwing dog toys because we also find a lot of plastic rubber balls and dog toys that get in the river. Shoes, I'm not sure. I think just a lot of people lose their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a picture of us kayaking um, and cleaning up at where Lake, was it? Lake 16. Lake 16. Um, that's a dog park and so there's tons of tennis balls and we go out and we pick up all the tennis balls and then if we have um, good ones we'll t pick out the ones that are not too grody and we'll, um, everybody at work has a dog so we hand them out there. Michelle, or we take them back to the park. Michelle goes to the dog park, she'll take them back there with her. We just recycle them. Um, here's a picture of two little boys. These little boys are homeschooled and their mom brings them to our cleanups sometimes and they pulled this construction barrel and look at how much fun they're having. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I like to see. So picking up trash isn't always boring. <laughs> and then this is a refrigerator we found. Um, this is actually my husband. I roped him into helping out with our cleanup and um, it's just to show that people still even now throw away refrigerators into the river because I don't know. I guess they think it's okay to just throw a refrigerator away in the river. And so how can you get involved? Every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. and every third Wednesday of the month we have an additional cleanup from 3 to 5 p.m. and that's part of our weekly clean program and they're at sites all over the watershed so we're each week we're in a different um, location. and. Um, that's called the weekly clean program and if you have a spot in our watershed that you would like us to do a weekly clean at, um, you can email me at amanda at crwc.org or call and I can help set one up. We provide the bags, gloves, and we will also make sure that um, we get the trash taken care of as well. And then we have our annual cleanup event which is a one day effort where we get about, we have about 15 to 20 sites. Um, throughout the watershed on one single day where people go out and clean up um, all over. And then these are some more pictures that I have. These were fourth graders that um, actually cleaned up at Lisa's uh, Adaptive Stream site. Um, and they had a blast. Kids love getting outside and picking up trash and they get excited when they find something cool. Um, this is a group of students from um, Hamtramck that I don't think had ever been to the lake before and they came out um, with this guy, he works for the Macomb County uh, Marine Sheriff's Division and he, he is a mentor for their green program at the school. So he brought them out and um, we collected about a thousand pounds of trash from the mouth of the Clinton River and these kids just had a blast out there enjoying the lake. And that's it. Great. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one thing: the cleanup that's on the third Wednesday is from four to six. We're getting in later. Yeah. Once time jumps ahead, um, we j we do it from three to five during the winter hours, so we can get it in before the daylight ends. Um, and I guess the take-home message that we want you to have is yes we'd love you to come and participate in our programs but if not our program somebody else in your community and um, what I've always encouraged my kids to do is if you see that piece of plastic the water bottle it might not be your piece of litter but it's going to be your problem our problem and it's our water resources that we all need to protect so I always try to encourage people to pick up all that trash that they're seeing um, out there. And this is your number one job, is to make children like that one who hates going outside. He looks like it, doesn't he? <laughs> he does, he'll swear to you he hates going outside. Make them go outside, get them outside, get them picking up trash, because you saw every single one of those kids that we had a picture of tonight had a smile on their face. and. Um, we need these folks to take care of our planet in the future, so get them out there. Thanks.
Yeah. yeah. He's the cutest one you see today, though, isn't he? <laughs> He's pretty smart. It's <laughs> okay, so uh, we now welcome Alliance for the Great Lakes, and we have uh, Sarah Neville here, who's the stewardship coordinator, who came all the way from Chicago to represent, yes, thank you, um, their organization. And so we, I really thank her for making that long trip. And I would like to note that Alliance for the Great Lakes has recently um, hired a Detroit staff person who cannot be with us tonight, but um, we're definitely making an investment in our area. And I'd like to take time to especially thank the Alliance for the plastic waters exhibit that's in the upper lobby. They um, brought that to our museum and we're certainly grateful that we're able to share it with you this evening and through the whole month long exhibition. So um, without this partnership, I don't know if this event tonight would have happened. So thank you and welcome Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I did travel from Chicago, but I am from Southeast Michigan, so it's always great ba to be back here. And you know, as I tell my colleagues in Illinois, uh, the Great Lakes mean a lot to the people of this state. Um, so it makes sense that so many of you came out here tonight. Just a little bit about the Alliance for the Great Lakes. So we're a regional organization. Our home base is in Chicago, but we have staff in Milwaukee, uh, Grand Haven, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo uh, as well. So we really cover the full scope of the Great Lakes. And we advance this work in many different ways. One of our, uh, our big branches of the organization is our policy work. So we work on issues like protecting our Great Lakes from invasive species. Uh, we do a lot of work around Asian carp in particular and looking to separate the Chicago River. We're also doing a lot of work a little bit closer home in Lake Erie to make sure that the nutrient problem, especially what happened this past year with the city of Toledo um, actually not being able to drink their water. We do a lot of work around trying to figure out how we can stop those nutrients from entering into Lake Erie. Uh, we also do a lot of work with cities. Um, one of our other core areas of focus is doing planning efforts. Right now in the Great Lakes we're seeing a lot of changes as a result of climate change and we're also seeing that our cities aren't necessarily prepared to handle those changes. So we work with municipalities to make sure that they have the plans in place to address issues like rising and falling water levels. Um, you know, in urban areas, including in southeast Michigan, I know you all saw a lot of flooding this past year with some pretty big rainstorms. And we work to make sure that there are things like green infrastructure, that we have rain gardens, native plantings in place so that uh, we're not being negatively impacted by some of these, um, these, these problems. Now, so the Alliance also does, and this is my work in particular, working in stewardship efforts. So one of our big programs is actually working with educators. Uh, the Alliance, and you can check out my table outside, we have a formal curriculum and we work uh, all the way from K to 12 with teachers, training them to use the Great Lakes as a laboratory. So we have a place-based uh, curriculum where we, we work with kids to teach them about our Great Lakes. And more so just teach them to actually get them out and experience. Um, so working in Chicago, we have um, a lot of students who, even though we're less than a mile away from Lake Michigan, who never have actually seen the lake. And so our education program really offers an opportunity for us to teach them about science, um, but to teach them in a way that actually gets them to experience something really spectacular in their own backyard. We also work up with grown-ups as well, and so these are just the, some photos from the past year where we've done. Uh, native plantings, we remove invasive species. We also do a lot of work doing what we call habitat assessments, where we take, um, we take folks through a special area and actually count and identify all the plants in a given area, and that helps us to monitor the, the health of that site over time. I wanted to talk about one project in particular because this one hits very close to home. I don't know if any of you recognize this location, but this is actually on the north side of Belle Isle. So we're actually finishing up a restoration project there where this part, the small track of land on the top uh, left, it's planted now, but that was an area that was completely covered with large chunks of concrete. Um, and through a project, we had all of that concrete removed and more so we worked with the local high school 
to actually have the student plant that stream bank so that it would stabilize the soil, hold that in place. And you can see they were having a lot of fun. They actually did some in uh, river planting. Now getting to the issue at hand tonight, plastic pollution, the Alliance's primary stewardship program is one called the Adopt-A-Beach program. And this is a beach cleanup program. But more than just having folks get out to their local beaches to clean them up, it, it's also a citizen science program. So we have every single person who goes out there tally and weigh what they find. And the result has been, uh, we have a database of 20 years of data looking at the types of litter we found. And I'll show you a little bit about that later. But, you know, this, this, this program picks up on a really basic point in that there's a lot of care for this resource in this region. And the Adopt a Beach program is just one way for someone to easily give back just a little bit to these Great Lakes that we all love and enjoy so much. So in the, the past year alone, we had uh, 15,000 people volunteer through this program. Um, the, the program's been going for 20 years strong. At this point, we're on almost every single beach, excluding some of the islands, uh, a lot of the islands in Lake Huron. But um, you know, it's a really accessible program if you're looking to get out there and actually do something. And, and the numbers are really just staggering in terms of 46,000 pounds of trash were removed alone. And our, our beach cleanups differ a little bit from the, the river um, cleanups in that we don't tend to find large refrigerators or tires. This is small, small pieces of plastic that people are picking up and are adding up to these enormous values. So for my last slide, I just wanted to show you this piece as we talk about plastic pollution. Because we can, because we can and do um, understand specifically what people are finding, it enables, to look, enables us to look at the different concentrations. And so the graph on your left actually looks at specific items, but I think more importantly, the graph at the right shows you just the extent to which plastic pollution is driving the litter that we find on our beach. Um, and, and the reason that plastic pollution is so problematic is because this doesn't break down. It might break down into smaller pieces, but this is not something that's going away. You know, we're finding it in our, our wildlife species. Um, we know that it's uh, negatively affecting our environment. And you know, the fortunate thing is that this is an issue that we can really address. Um, we just actually did a study published with an author at Loyola University that looked at sources. Where is this plastic coming from on our beaches? And it pointed directly at us. These were things that we were bringing to our beaches. So I just want to leave you with that. This idea of care is a real one. Um, you know it, right? In neighborhoods where the lawns are manicured, people tend to mow their lawns more. And the same thing is for our environment. When people see a clean beach or see, see people out there cleaning up their beach, that, that element of care really does run through and they're less likely to litter as well. So think about not only when you get out and do any of these great programs, um, you're having an impact larger than just that day that you spent on the beach, on the river, or in your community. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I did want to take a moment um, to recognize Friends of the Detroit River. They unfortunately were not able to be with us this evening, but they are indeed a partner with Cranbrook Institute of Science through the Detroit River Water Festival. So in case you're not from the Rouge River Watershed or the Clinton River Watershed and you're not near a beach, <laughs> I would uh, encourage you to participate in the Detroit River cleanup or maybe all of them. This one is Saturday, um, April 25th from 9 to 2. And, uh, Trisha Blacharski did note to me that one unique thing is they, they do boat volunteers out to islands in the Detroit River for cleanup. So perhaps that would be an interesting and unique experience that you would enjoy. Um, so um, you can, I have some flyers out on the table there, so be sure to, to pick those up if you find interest in that or, or visit their website. <clears throat> 